what's up you guys and welcome back to my channel for those of you who are already part of the family thank you so much for joining me here again today for those of you who are new welcome my name is Kia Selena I'm a practical nurse and I'm hoping that you are going to join my family by subscribing and turning on that notification bell I post videos every single week and communicate frequently with my subscribers in my community section you can also get a hold of me very easily on my social media platforms which I will leave in the description so make sure you support the kids so in today's video similarly to the last video not even that is not a medical prescription because with a prescription you would at least see numbers because when a when a doctor prescribes a medication they have to write the name of the medication but they also have to write the dose and they have to write how long this patient is going to be on it for and I don't even see numbers on that here. video I was testing my nursing knowledge by seeing if I could decipher doctors handwritten prescriptions because we all know about doctors and their crazy handwriting but I was also testing my pharmacology skills by seeing if I could recognize those medications and explain what they are so make sure you go check that video out I'll, I'll leave the information for it down below as well as the link in the description and the end card so make sure you go check that out it was very fun and very informative. In today's video I'm going to once again be testing my nursing knowledge in order to make this video as real as possible once again just like I did in the last video I did not look for this quiz by myself I asked somebody to look for a random nursing quiz for me and send me the link which they did so that way I know that I haven't seen any of the questions or anything like that and all the reactions all the answers you guys are gonna get from me are going to be on the spot so this is so for this video, it doesn't really matter who you are, whether you're an aspiring nurse, a nursing student, or a nurse, this video is going to be jam-packed with information that I'm sure everyone can use if you're in the nursing field. For this, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on because I'm blind as a bat. Okay, so the quiz that they sent me was from quizly.co. Um, I'm guessing this is like a quiz from the UK. It says, can you answer these basic nursing questions? So, I hope I can. You know, seeing that I'm a nurse, let's see. It says a heart rate between 600 to 100 beats per minute is considered and the options are too low, normal, or too high. So for those of you who are just starting out nursing, this is good for you guys. A normal heart rate is between 600 and 100 BPM or beats per minute which I got right, right on the money. So this question is about blood tests. Let's see. It says, which of the following blood tests should be performed before a blood transfusion? And without looking, you want to do a cross match. You wanna make sure that you're giving this person the right type of blood, that's for sure. So we have prothrombin and coagulation time. You would not be doing that. That is more something you would do if somebody's going into surgery to see their clotting factors, to see how quickly they clot, because you won't want them to hemorrhage in the OR. So we're not gonna do a thrombin and coagulation time. Blood typing and cross matching, for sure. Bleeding and clot clotting time, I think it's pretty much the same thing as the first one, which is prothrombin and coagulation time. It is pretty much the same thing. So I'm gonna go with blood typing and cross matching, and it says fantastic. The answer is blood typing and cross matching. Before transfusion is performed, I'm pretty sure they're gonna say the same thing that I said. You wanna make sure that you're giving the person the right type of blood. So it says the standard fifth vital sign is, so this could be different because we have blood pressure and pulse. I always like do put them together. So for cardiovascular, we have blood pressure and pulse. For respiratory, we have O2 and respiration. And then we also have temperature, which should be the fifth. But I do know that sometimes um, they consider a glucose check the fifth vital sign. So it's either gonna be temperature without looking. I know it's either gonna be temperature or, um, or oh my God, glucose, yes. So we have pain, blood pressure, glucose, and pulse. Ooh, pain. It could also be pain. I know some people consider pain a fifth vital, but I'm gonna go with blood glucose. Let's see. Oh no, it says not quite right. The correct answer is pain. So it was pain. There are four prim primary vital signs, body temp, BP, pulse, and breathing rate however depending on the clinical setting these may include other measurements called the fifth vital sign which pain is considered a standard fifth vital sign so the fifth vital sign is pain but it really could have been temperature and it also could have been glucose so so the next question is which of the following qualities are relevant in documenting patient care organization accuracy and consciousness thoroughness and currentness and all of the above 
I would say all of the above. You really want to be like very, very detailed, very ac as accurate as possible, as organized as possible, and as thorough as possible. Not only to let the nurses know exactly what you did, but also sometimes the small things may seem small, but that can also be the thing that saves you in court if ever you do end up in court. So make sure that you write everything. At least that's what my teachers taught me. Write everything. Even if it seems like it's a small thing, write it anyway. So all of the above. It says great job. The answer is all of the above. And I'm sure it's because of the reasons that I just explained to you. The next question is a two-month-old child. Oh my God. I really, really suck at Pete's. Okay. A two-month-old child has a cleft lip repair. For those of you who don't know what cleft lip is, have you guys ever seen those babies and they have like, um, like a lip, like... They have kind of like a small like slit where their lip is and usually they get like surgery to repair it. I don't know how to explain it. I'll probably leave a picture up here so you guys can see what it is. Which type of restraint would be recommended in this case? Okay, so you're not gonna put a regular restraint. You're not gonna put an abdominal restraint and you're not gonna put like hand restraints on a baby. But um, the only thing that would make sense for me without looking at it would be putting gloves on the baby's hand to prevent the baby from scratching, picking, or tugging at their face. So I'm gonna go with, um, with gloves. That just seems like the most humane thing to do, especially to a baby. Oh, there's a picture of the cleft lip, so I don't have to do that. I'll show you guys that. So there's elbow, jacket, glove hitch, and mummy. I'm gonna go with glove hitch. No, the correct answer is elbow. An elbow restraint will prevent the child from touching the surgical site without hindering movement to other parts of the body. So that's that. I really would have thought gloves, but to them. It's okay, a patient has developed a thrombophlebitis of the left leg. Which nursing intervention should be given at the highest priority? Okay. So warm compress, maintain complete bed rest. Definitely, definitely elevate legs on to pillows. For sure, for sure, for sure. Because with thrombophlebitis, which is basically a clot in your, um, usually in your leg, um, you, especially in the calf, you will see you there will be warmth, mm, not really swelling, sometimes swelling, but warmth definitely, definitely and pain, especially when you do... Um, what is that called? Oh my God, I completely forgot what it's called, but there's something that we do in nursing to test. It's like one way to see if a person possibly has a cloth in their leg or a thrombophlebitis. And what we do is we just take the foot and we push it back. If there's any pain in the calf, that's usually a sign. I can't remember what that's called. I know it starts with an H, I think, but I can't remember what it's called. So you guys remind me in the comments. That was the right answer. That's the way. The correct answer is to elevate the legs on two pillows. The first goal is non-pharmacologic intervention and to is to minimize edema, right? Edema is swelling of the affected extremity by leg elevation. Next question. Which of the following constitutes a break in sterile technique while preparing a sterile field for a dressing change? So whenever you have a sterile dressing, there's usually a sterile field, which for those of you who are new to nursing, it's kind of like a paper. One side will be shiny plastic, the other side will be paper, and you will put that down, and that is what you're gonna put your sterile equipment on. Now there's a one inch barrier, which means that you cannot put, once you put your sterile stuff in or on that one inch barrier, it is no longer sterile because you touch that like that one inch is the inch that you're allowed to touch when unpacking your stuff. So you basically just have to make sure that you keep everything away from that one inch. So touching the outside wrapper of a sterile material without sterile gloves, no. Placing a sterile object on the edge, which is exactly what I just said. You cannot put sterile stuff on the edge because you can actually touch that part and whatever you touch is not sterile anymore. So that's what it is. Beautiful. The edges of a sterile field are considered contaminated. So that's that. Next question. This is gonna be a long video. Anti-embolism stockings are used to, okay, so an embolism is a clot, once again, and anti. So anti-clot um, stockings are used to, so we wanna prevent clots. So we have provide external warmth, prevent dependent edema, and promote venous circulation oh my god that's true it's between a or b i'm gonna go with it could be a for edema too but i'm gonna go with a let's see yep that is the way 
Anti-embolism stockings are commonly are commonly referred as TED holes. Never heard it as that. Uh, oh, short for thromboembolism deficient deterrent hose. And they're used for venous supplies. So that's that. I can't talk today. I don't know what's up with me. A patient who develops highs after receiving an antibiotic is exhibiting, okay, an allergic reaction. If you give somebody a drug and they start developing hives, they probably have an alert. They're probably having an allergic reaction. So I'm gonna go with allergy, which is also right. I don't really think I need to explain that to you guys. I think it's self-explanatory. Next one, which of the following patients are at greater risk for contracting an infection? So anybody who's immunocompromised will be at risk of an infection. So anything, um, anything who's immune, anyone who's immunocompromised, especially if it has anything to do with white blood cells, like if you have leukemia or anything like that, no. So a newly diagnosed diabetic patient, they're also kind of immuno. Uh, compromise but mm, nah, I, there's also leukopenia a patient receiving blood strectum antibiotics and a post-operative patient who has undergone orthopedic surgery now all of these patients are at risk of developing infections but the person who is most at risk would be the person who has leukopenia why because their white blood cells which is basically the um the army in your blood cells that basically help with healing if your army is compromised then your healing is also going to be slower and since they already have problems with their white blood cells they are definitely the person who's the most at risk so i'm gonna go with the patient with leukopenia let's see yep terrific so that's that a sterile technique is used whenever an invasive procedure is performed, terminal disinfection is performed, strict isolation is required, protective isolation is necessary. So whenever you're doing something invasive, you are going to use the sterile technique. Invasive, yep. And that was the right answer. All invasive procedures, including surgery, catheter insertion, administration of per, what? Parenteral therapy. Basically, whenever you're entering someone's like body or you're doing any type of dressing or any on anything that is open, um, you're gonna use the sterile technique. Which of the following statements about chest X-ray is false? No contraindications. Okay, so I don't know if they're allowed to eat before an X-ray. I can't remember. Let's see. Eating, drinking, and all medications are allowed before this test. A signed consent is not required. Before the procedure, the patient should remove all jewelry and metallic objects. Yes. And no contradic uh, contraindications exist for this test. So I'm going to go with the metallic things. Sounds like it's, it makes sense. No. Okay. So there's no contraindications for a an x-ray. So I guess the no eating thing would be more for like MRI, CT, stuff like that. Okay, what does palliative care mean? Palliative is end of life care. So you would be caring for people who are terminally ill. Improving the quality of life of patients with serious illness. So yes, because even though they are at the end of their life or even if they're they have terminal illnesses you still want to make sure that you know you provide comfort and that you are there and that you're supporting them and everything throughout their last days so without reading the other ones i'm just gonna go with that um this so that was the right answer it says cool the answer is palliative care but just to address the second answer it says improving the quality of life of aged patients that would be more long-term care than palliative care okay what is the most accurate way to measure core temperature? Definitely rectally. Rectally is the way to get the most accurate temperature. So you have tympanic, you can do it axilla, you can do it PO, you can even do it in the ears, but rectally, if you want a, an accurate answer, you would do the rectal route. So rectally, and it says excellent. And then normal internal body temperature is, for us, I wanna say between 35 and like, 35 and like 37 degrees Celsius. So we have 35.6 Celsius, 37.7 Celsius. I'm gonna go with 37. Yeah, impressive. The answer is 37 Celsius for, for us. You guys use Fahrenheit. 
what are court uh, oh i can never say this word court cough sounds so court cough sounds are the sound is the sound that you hear when you're taking somebody's blood pressure you put the um the cuff on and but this is when you're doing it manually so you would put the cuff onto their arm and you would put their stethoscope right here and you would pump and you would hear the court cough sounds um as you're taking the blood pressure or yeah so sounds heard while measuring blood pressure pathological heart murmurs no functional heart murmurs no and outstanding court court cough sounds are sounds that are medically that are that medical personnel listen to when they are taking blood pressure using non-invasive procedures i can't read today guys i don't know what's up with me Typically, the influenza vaccine is administered via which route? Okay, so I spoke about this in my last video. In um, When you're doing like a poke or an injection, there are three different routes you can do. Either intravenous, which is into the vein. Subcutaneous, which you see a lot in, in, in uh, diabetic patients who receive insulin. They get it subcutaneous, which is the subcutaneous tissue or like the fat behind the arm or on the butt or on the legs, like fatty areas. And then you have intramuscular, which is into the muscle. Whenever you're doing an influenza vaccination, it is intramuscular. You will not do that IV. You will not do that sub-Q either. I think they're coming out with sub-Q um, vaccination but for the most part it is intramuscular so I'm gonna go with that and that was my answer it says wonderful um, okay epinephrine can be used to treat all of the following conditions except so epinephrine is adrenaline so you would use that whenever um, someone if someone's in anaphylactic shock if someone is having any problems with their heart you would maybe give them epinephrine because epinephrine does make your heart rate go up. So um, it says anaphylactic shock, cardiac arrest, and high blood sugar. You would not use epinephrine for high blood sugar. You would not use that. But for cardiac arrest and anaphylactic shock, like I just said, um, you would use epi. So high blood sugar, it says sweet. Also known as adrenaline is a medication, hormone, neurotransmitter. It is used for a number of conditions, including anaphylactic, anaphylaxis cardiac arrest and superficial bleeding because if somebody is bleeding out a lot their heart rate will also go down okay all of the following are good sources of vitamin a except so when i think vitamin a i honestly never remember what foods have what vitamin but when i think vitamin a i think greens so i know the answer is going to be something oh it says except and i know that potatoes sweet potatoes are high in vitamin a that's like one thing I always remembered. Okay, so except, so egg yolks. Egg yolks, I'm thinking more omega-3 fatty acids, protein, carrots, apricots, and white potatoes. So I know since I know sweet potatoes do have vitamin A, I'm gonna assume that white potatoes do too. Carrots and apricot seems, I'm gonna go with egg yolks because egg yolk seems more like a omega-3 fatty acid thing to me. I was wrong. It says, hmm, I don't think so. The main source of vitamin A are yellow and green vegetables, such as carrots, sweet potatoes, like I said, squash, spinach, collard greens, broccoli, and cabbage, and yellow fruits, such as apricots and cantaloupe. Animal sources of animal sources include liver, kidney, uh, cream, butter, and egg yolks. So I just learned something. Egg yolks do have vitamin A. A nurse explains to a patient that a cough Okay, so what is a cough? It's your body's like natural response to when anything foreign enters your respiratory tract, I guess. So whenever you cough, it's that your body is trying to get rid of something that shouldn't be there. That's the natural response, right? So it's a protective response to clear the respiratory tract of irritants. Yeah, uh, without reading the rest, um, well, I'll read the rest. It is induced by the administration of an anti-tusive drug. No, because tusive in French, to say means to cough. Um, anti to say means anti cough. So you're not gonna cough if you get an anti cough drug. Can be inhibited by splinting the abdomen. Um, no, is primarily is primarily a voluntary action. You don't cough voluntarily. So I mean, sometimes we do. You have something stuck in your throat. You know, you'll cough voluntarily. But usually, if something enters your respiratory tract, you're automatically gonna cough if that thing doesn't belong there, which it probably doesn't. So, answer is A. You've nailed it. Coughing is a protective response that clears the respiratory tract of irritants. We are almost done, guys. We're at 84%.
Which of the following is not a sign or symptom of respiratory distress? So for respiratory distress, somebody has difficulty breathing, you would probably see um, cyanosis, which is like blue tips of like your fingers, maybe your toes, you'd see it in your lips or paleness. You would see abdominal retractions a lot, especially with babies, you would see them retracting. Um, with babies, you would also see pursed lips. What else? I can't remember. So let's see, breathing through pursed lips, um, nail bed cyanosis, an expiratory grunt in children, adoption of the supine position, which is not a sign of symptom or of respiratory distress. Okay, so adoption of the supine position. You would never see somebody lay supine. For those of you who don't know what supine means, it means flat on your back. If you are flat on your back, your lungs and diaphragm cannot expand to their full capability, and so it makes it harder for you to breathe. So naturally, if you have difficulty breathing, you would either sit up or sometimes even, even stand up if you are able to, but you would never see somebody um, in a supine position. Prone means flat down, supine means facing up, so I'm definitely gonna go with adoption of the supine position because a grunt in children, you will hear children grunt if they have difficulty breathing nail bed cyanosis once again blue tips and breathing through pursed lips will definitely be one so adoption of the supine position and it says perfect that's that let's go to the next one children are more prone to respiratory distress as a result of airway inflammation or infection because I remember learning this and I think it has something to do with like the inside of their mouth and the shape of it or something, but I can't remember. So let's see the option. The They become more anxious than adults, thus increasing the demand for oxygen, no. They do not have the ability to become tachypneic in response to respiratory insufficiency, no. Um, Tachy means fast heart rate. So tachypnea means fast heart rate and brady would be slow. Um, they have funnel shaped airways with narrow portion with a narrow portion that is prone to occlusion and narrowing. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that one just because of the word shape and it says beautiful. Okay guys, we're almost wrapping up. Carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by a compression of which nerve? The medium, axilla, ulnar or radial? Median, oh, oh my god, oh my god. Um, I'm thinking radial. I'm gonna go with radial. No, it's the medium nerve. Okay, so, and they show us where the nerve is. So that's where the median nerve is. Carpal tunnel, for those of you who don't know, it's like, um, my mom has it, she's a hairdresser. People who use their hands a lot for work um, long term will usually develop carpal tunnel. Sometimes her wrist will like completely lock while she's doing someone's hair and she'll have to give it a couple seconds to like loosen up, so yeah. When transferring a patient from bed to chair, the nurse should use which muscles to avoid back injury? Whenever you're doing a transfer, put the weight on your legs, do not strain your back, always. Simple as that. Don't strain your arms, don't strain, you know, really bend back, like bend forward and use your legs to pull up. Don't use your, don't use your back to pull up because then you can hurt your back and end up on sick leave and we don't have time for that. So leg muscles, which was the right answer. It says excellent. This video is getting really long, I'm getting scared. And last one, a patient with no known allergies is receiving penicillin every six, every six hours. When administering the medication, the nurse observes a fine rash on the patient's skin. The most appropriate nurse, nursing action would be to stop the administration. If somebody gets hives after receiving a medication, especially antibiotics, penicillin is an antibiotic, not even especially. If anybody develops any sign of an allergy after the administration of a medication, you stop immediately. If you are an LPN and you're working with an RN, advise your RN. If you are a nurse and you're just working by yourself, stop the administration, call the doctor and see what can be done because you cannot continue giving somebody a medication that they are allergic to, girl, like what? So it says apply cornstarch, no, because if they're allergic to it, it doesn't matter what you put on it, they're allergic to it. They're gonna continue getting sick every time you give it. Administration, admis, and in, oh my God. Administer the medication and notify the physician, no. Withhold and notify the physician, yes. Bravo, the answer is to withhold. 
right? And we don't, I don't think we need a, a, an explanation for that. I think that makes sense. So let's see what my results are. And if you've made it this far and you still haven't subscribed, like what you doing? What you doing, boo boo? Hit on that subscribe button and support the kid. Clearly you like my content because 17 minutes and 30 seconds later, you're still here. Not even more than that. Okay guys, so it was taking really long to load my result, but you guys all saw it. I think I got two or three answers wrong. So if I do say so myself, I think I did pretty good. And I think I can say with confidence that yes, I do know basic nursing. Okay, so I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys did and you guys wanna see more like this, please make sure you tell me down in the comment section below. If you are not yet subscribed as usual, please make sure you do so and turn on your notification bell. If you wanna have a one-on-one -on -one with me, my door is always open. Well, my Instagram door is always open. You can reach me on there. And with that being said, I really hope to see you guys in my next video. Stay safe out there with this whole coronavirus thing going on. And I love you guys. Bye.